I think it would spell the end of IVF for all practical reasons in these states. And should it happen that Republicans ever succeeded in getting the House, the Senate, and the presidency at the same time, there would be a nationwide anti-choice bill that would put the end to IVF in all the states. Today, we're talking about an incredibly sensitive, timely, and urgent topic, the impact of the overturn of Roe v. Wade on reproductive health in the U.S., and specifically how this could change IVF as we know it. Roe v. Wade is about more than elective abortion. It is about all reproductive rights. I am thrilled to have Chris Charbonneau on the show today. Chris has spent the last 40 years advocating for reproductive rights and access to abortion care, including her role as the longest serving CEO of Planned Parenthood and her latest role as host of the Fall of Roe podcast, where she educates and guides us through what is happening to all reproductive rights since the overturn of Roe v. Wade in June. Chris, I am thrilled to have you here today to talk about a topic that is extremely important to both of us. Thank you so much. Laura, thank you for inviting me to your show. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. All right, Chris, what does the overturn of Roe v. Wade mean for women's health nationwide? I think this is an incredibly risky time. We are used to, in America, as women, having our rights protected by the Supreme Court and having had a standard of care that has lasted for the better part of 50 years. And suddenly that has been ripped away. And this has created a patchwork of 50 different states worth of theory and guidance and, frankly, attack in some places on women's reproductive health care. That has, I think, turned into a much bigger issue than many people thought an abortion regulation would turn into. And so that's why I'm so eager to talk about this with your audience, because I think it has huge implications for anyone who can become pregnant. Right. It's more than about access to safe abortion care. It's about all reproductive rights. And I was born after the passing of Roe v. Wade. I have practiced and trained in a time where these rights were protected. And I truly, honestly knew it was always under threat, but I was in a little bit of a denial that it would ever be taken away because I've never known an era without it. It's quite nerve wracking and something to kind of wrap your head around. I just appreciate your perspective on this. Sure is nerve wracking. I was 13 when Roe was passed. I remember them announcing this. I didn't, of course, as a 13 year old, really understand what that meant, but it did mean that I met a great many people, relatively young in my life, that had undergone illegal abortion and what that meant to people. And I just, there were just any number of women who were talking about feeling like criminals doing what they felt they had to do or feeling like they couldn't feed another person. And people had to do extraordinary things. I talked to women in their 80s who said that in Catholic hospitals, people had done hysterectomies on them so that they could cover the fact that they were actually doing a termination of pregnancy. Oh, my goodness. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, like huge additional harms to people because they could not straightforwardly provide the care. People Mm -hmm. taking all kinds of chances I had people close to me who talked to me about their doctor who ultimately delivered their babies doing an abortion for them earlier in their lives. And those were the lucky ones where a qualified OBGYN or doc that was trained generally in things took care of them in other ways. But those people all did so at a tremendous risk to their licenses and their careers. Everybody was at risk in the whole thing. A lot of people who are not at all involved in your life suddenly have sway over what happens to you. We normalize things like investigating women who have poor pregnancy outcomes. It's just unthinkable. And yet here we find ourselves. I think of 
stories that my mom told me going to high school in the 1960s and Mm -hmm. her friends being terrified about getting pregnant and what that would mean and what options are open. I think Mm -hmm. maybe my generation might remember the movie Dirty Dancing and Baby's father helping a woman who needed to have a termination that had complications. You know, in that movie, that might be someone's only sort of window into the way that it could be. And when I talk to most people, you know, they think, well, gosh, we're not going to get back to the 1960s. And like, you're just really over dramatizing things. And, and I do truly hope that that's the case. But there are some real life things that are happening, even in the last few months after the overturn of Roe v. Wade, that are impacting reproductive care that have actually nothing to do with access to abortion. So Mm -hmm. it really is impacting anyone of reproductive age. My big fear in this, Laura, was that when they overturned Roe, everyone was going to be so subtle about it, we'd have a hard time explaining to people the danger of what was happening. And I was wrong to worry about that. They are not being subtle at all. And we are seeing people in Louisiana who were saying that women shouldn't be allowed to be treated for ectopic pregnancy because those are fetuses. It's like, those are not fetuses that are ever going to make it all the way through because ectopic pregnancy is the end of the line for the woman if you don't treat it, and in any case for the fetus. There's you know, no m- moving anything from one place to the other. You are exactly right. That is such a good example. I mm-hmm. mean, there was the bill in... Ohio, the House Bill 413, that is an amazing example of how politicians just do not understand women's health. Mm -hmm. And in that bill, it's basically saying that there could be criminalized, the doctors could be found to, you know, negligent if they don't attempt to try to re-implant an ectopic pregnancy. Now, this bill did not pass. Mm -hmm. But this is the kind of thing that's being talked about. And when my patients see news coverage on this, this has happened to me. I had a patient, highly desired pregnancy, IVF pregnancy, wants to be a mom, unfortunately diagnosed with an ectopic pregnancy. And I had Mm -hmm. to talk to her about treating that pregnancy. And she said, well, can't you re-implant it? Like I've read about that online. Thank goodness I have this incredible relationship with her and this trust And I can explain that that's absolutely not possible, but imagine being a doctor in an emergency room and a woman just not understanding that she could have bleeding and significant complications. We're not talking about some Star Trek scenario where you can just beam something into another location and super glue it on. And over and over again, we see people who have no qualifications to be calling these things. And then even more horrifying the cavalier approach to the people who are pregnant in all of this, the idea of investigating someone as a miscarriage is horrific. But the idea of somebody electing to have an abortion because they feel they need one, and then having legislators have a discussion like the one they had in Louis- also Louisiana, where they were saying, should we write a bill that allows us to execute a woman for having an abortion? Or should we have to make sure that she's not still pregnant before we execute her later. And it was like, Mm -hmm. you're really talking about executing women Mm -hmm. for making decisions about their own lives that may not really seem like choices to them. It may seem like imperatives. For a while, they suggested that they would never do anything harmful to women themselves, that it was always somehow evil doctors or evil boyfriends or evil family members that were forcing women to do a thing that they would never do. And we know that that's not true. Women have all kinds of feelings about decisions they need to make. And women who have already had children make decisions to have abortions. In fact, most of the people who have abortions are also women who have children, and they are very likely calculating what they need to do to be good moms to the children that they have. For people to try to put themselves in somebody else's shoes and make unilateral policy as though that's going to be successful is ridiculous. And what people knew before Roe was you cannot stop people from ending pregnancies they don't want to have. The only thing you can do is stop them from being safe. Drive people into places where 
they're not getting good medical counsel and create a giant mess that ends up being harmful to entire families and ultimately a society. You end up in these really suboptimal situations where do we really want to interfere with the best judgment of the doctors taking care of someone who are trying to maximize their chances for those healthy pregnancies and very much wanted families by interfering with situations that need the at the spot call and don't need necessarily the most ignorant lawmakers you can imagine in your worst nightmare leaning over Dr. Laura Shaheen's shoulder and telling her what to do. If we were sitting around opining about how to regulate AR-15s and, you know, and we got the terminology wrong about bump stocks or whatever, these people would be all over us about how we shouldn't have any say about gun regulation because we don't know what we're talking about. But they're in there talking about uteruses and tubes and implants. They clearly have no clue. And, you know, how is that okay? So I'd say we won't talk about exactly the gun thing, although we might talk about the end result. If you'll stop talking about women's reproductive anatomy with no idea, how about that as a deal? Really? Did it have to get this stupid this fast? Mm -hmm. I'm sort of astounded that we don't even have the laws in place in these states where people are operating according to the new regime. And we have all kinds of trouble already happening on the front. We have people having to carry fetuses that are no longer viable because doctors are afraid to end these pregnancies for the women after they've failed, lest they be accused of somehow doing an abortion. That is unthinkable. I have met people who were in the early days charged with murder. They were charged with murder for doing the normal doctor thing. I think it's a lot to ask somebody who has invested decades of their lives learning things and getting the degrees and getting all of the paperwork in order so that society has says, yes, indeed, you are a qualified OBGYN specialist. And for them to have to risk it all every day while they go into work in a million of these scenarios, just wondering which one of them comes to bite them. And they were challenging some of these doctors that I've met over the years with jail time and loss of their freedom and loss of everything that they've built in their lives. I mean, what are we asking people who have given everything to serve us all as medical providers? And do we not owe them every protection that laws and other things could give them while they're trying to take the best care of us? I think about the patients that I care for with miscarriage, right? Yes. So the term abortion, we have to clarify that. Abortion mm -hmm. is a medical term that just means that the pregnancy has stopped before delivery or before yep. term, before viability. And a spontaneous abortion, we talk in society, that's a miscarriage. Mm -hmm. And an elective termination of pregnancy, we say that's an abortion. But actually, that's a therapeutic abortion mm -hmm. and a miscarriage is a spontaneous abortion. Yep. And so even when my patients get the bills from their insurance company, they'll see that they had a miscarriage of a highly desired pregnancy and mm -hmm. it'll say spontaneous abortion on the bill. Right. And they call us in tears, Dr. Yeah. Sheen, why did you say that I had an abortion? I'm like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, this is a medical term. That's right. And this is being called into question mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. certain states right now. And I think about my patients that are Choosing a way to resolve the pregnancy and move on and be able to try again and build a family right. is to use medication to help the pregnancy pass. And that can actually decrease the risk of infection. Mm -hmm. It can help them move on emotionally. And there are patients who have gone to pharmacies in Texas to fill prescriptions for mesoprostol to help pass a highly desired pregnancy. And pharmacists are not filling the prescription. And these people are being put under scrutiny in the middle of their grief. So they're not only grieving the loss of this pregnancy, this life that they were hoping for, but yeah. then now they're having to defend and fight for medical care. Under a cloud of suspicion. And it's like, what did any of these people do to deserve any kind of cloud of suspicion? One of the really unattractive things about this, Laura, is I feel like the people who go after these patients are trying to make names for themselves politically. 
really, of all the crimes in the world, you're going to start investigating women who have planned pregnancies, who are miscarrying. It strikes me as like, is there enough money in law enforcement for this? There are people murdering people out in the world, and there are people committing all kinds of very damaging crimes. Isn't that where our focus really ought to be? We had an excellent discussion on your podcast. We're talking all about this impact of reproductive rights and how it can impact my patients who are trying to build their families with IVF. Uh This is a fallout that a lot of people don't think about. They kind of, sometimes when I bring it up with people who are not in the field, they kind of roll their eyes a little bit and they're like, Mm -hmm. oh, IVF isn't going to be affected. What are you talking about? And so I think it's important to kind of clarify this. A lot of these trigger laws that were going to go into effect with the overturn of Roe v. Wade really defined life and wanted to protect at all costs at fertilization, meaning that once an egg and sperm are fertilized, then that embryo now has rights and they wanted to prevent abortion at any stage after an egg and sperm are fertilized. And these personhood bills, which as of the recording of this podcast are not passed yet, Mm -hmm. but if they were, then that can dramatically change how we practice IVF. And the fallout from that can really be very impactful. Yes. The anti-choice movement has sort of rallied around this idea of fertilized embryos and They have what they call snowflake campaigns, and they call them snowflakes because these embryos are frozen, that these are frozen people that have every right that you also have, and therefore there would be probably a prohibition against creating them. There could be all kinds of rules about implanting them. You could probably never implant more than one. I mean, you know, there'd be all kinds of stipulations about what you'd have to do and how you'd have to treat this if you were even allowed to do it. And can we just all of us give up the idea that we've been alarmist over the years? I mean, here we are in a situation where they're literally talking about the death penalty for women making reproductive health decisions. I don't think we were alarmist enough. I mean, this is seriously nightmarish, dystopian, handmaid's tale kind of stuff. And there are people who are for it. Glad to say there are a whole lot more people who are against it. You know, we've seen this before. So in Italy in 2008, the government decided that, you know, they needed to protect embryos. So Mm -hmm. they only allowed women who were doing IVF to fertilize up to three eggs. And Mm -hmm. they had to transfer any embryos that were created. And actually weren't really doing a great job of freezing eggs at that time. Mm-hmm. And so number one, success rates were abysmal. Yeah. Um, if someone got pregnant, they had a high chance of twins or triplets and a, a very high risk pregnancy. And Italy learned really fast that this did not make sense. It increased costs, decreased success rates, and really burdened the healthcare system, but also the people that were trying to build their family. People do not realize how inefficient human reproduction is. Each egg has maybe a 5% chance of becoming a embryo that turns into a baby. So if you are limiting how we practice IVF by limiting the number of eggs that we can fertilize by not allowing people to do genetic testing on embryos because that's biopsying an embryo, Mm -hmm. and someone could say that's harming, by not Mm -hmm. allowing people to freeze embryos, you are increasing the number of egg retrievals, you're increasing costs, and you're making something that is already difficult to access, very costly for a lot of people. It's just making it worse. And should it happen that Republicans ever succeeded in getting the House, the Senate, and the presidency at the same time, there would be a nationwide anti-choice bill that would put the end to IVF in all the states. And we are within four seats of that in the House this year, although this might be heard after that. We are at risk of the Senate turning over. If there were to be a Republican president coming up in 2024, that person would sign such a bill. And I think then it would be whatever you could conceive without any assistance would be your only options. The others would come off the table. I was incredibly gratified, though, to see the people of Kansas, which is a very red kind of conservative state, 
stand up and say, no, we think all this has gone too far. And we actually don't agree with taking rights and options away from people. And not only no, but hell no, we're not going to do this. And so any state where we could see a referendum, I believe, would have the same kind of result if people are paying attention. And that buoys my heart that we might be able to, over time, protect all these states one at a time to get them into a different spot. Another fallout or consequence by taking away a federal protection and putting it back on the states is medical deserts. So yes. already, you know, medical schools, residency training programs are seeing a drop in applications in states without protection for reproductive mm -hmm. rights because anybody that wants to take care of people with uteruses need to be trained on how to evacuate a uterus in order to save their patient's life. And if you are training in a state where reproductive rights are threatened, if you're not allowed to practice medicine in the way that is best for your patients, you are not going to have doctors in these States. Why would anyone <laughs> move to a place where Aww. someone, you could be practicing your profession to the, the highest level of your qualifications and you'd risk someone accusing you of a crime? Why would you practice there when you could go across some state line somewhere else and practice? And so, you know, you're in Washington, the Californians are good, the New Yorkers are good, the Northeast and the, the West Coast are good, but there's an entire middle of the country where Illinois is the only state that is for sure, and the Southern states would be entirely a desert. Imagine you have a normal pregnancy and you just want to deliver in Alabama or Kentucky or any of these places. And there are no doctors or there are no midwives or no anybody that's trained to help you because you have created such a risky situation for that profession that nobody could legitimately make an excuse for themselves of why they do that. People really comfort themselves when you kind of talk about like, oh, you know, it's okay that it's not federally protected. People will just be able to travel to different states or some companies that are saying like, oh, you know, we will pay for you to mm -hmm. travel to a different state to get a abortion if you need it. They, they could definitely say some of these wealthier companies, oh, we'll pay for you to go and do IVF mm -hmm. elsewhere. But that is just separating. That's like even more privilege. And this is really sure. isolating. And how many visits do some of your IVF patients make to you? Right. Well, an IVF cycle, I mean, it's a pretty intense two weeks um, of multiple visits and then an egg retrieval. And then they're typically coming back for an embryo transfer. That's very disruptive for work. And is your, your company home. really going to pay for you to fly to see Dr. Laura Shaheen seven times? in a two or three week period. Can you even pull that off? You all are working against the clock all the time and where things are in a cycle and timing the drugs with everything else. Is that even possible? Or are we just saying to women in some of the states of the United States, if you have need assistance in your reproductive life and those technologies are just not available to you. This is absolutely impacting people without resources even more. And IVF is a great example about how some people have access to it and some people don't. Not every state mandates coverage. Not every company provides this benefit. This is a medical disease defined mm -hmm. by the World Health Organization that benefits mm -hmm. from medical treatment. You don't choose to have infertility, even just location-wise. That mm -hmm. is a huge burden to an already burdened community that's already right. feeling vulnerable. My patients, as soon as the overturn of Roe v. Wade, our phones blew up. You know, what do we do with our embryos, Dr. Shaheen? Right. You know, should I, you know, freeze my eggs? Should I not do IVF anymore? Can you do a transfer soon as possible so that I can get pregnant so that I can like still have access to this? We have patients calling us from all over the country. Can I move my embryos to Washington? Because I am terrified that I'm going to be told what to do with them. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is just impacting everybody in the country. It's not mm -hmm. just one group or another. You know, when you take rights away, especially a broad right, like determining anything about your reproductive health, you tend to affect everybody. 
everybody. So there are the people who are not yet pregnant, who are young. They don't know whether they have fertility problems, but they might. And they don't know that this will be the thing that prevents them from building a family later. People think it applies to another group of people, but not them. I would suggest for the men that there is no successful economy that does not also rely on people with uteruses, women, the girls that are eventually going to be women, having a place in the economic life of the country. There is nobody this doesn't apply to on some level. And where this comes to bite you that you don't know. I mean, I was just watching TV, Laura, the other day, and a guy who had voted over and over again against reproductive health was crying about a woman who was in incredible medical distress who could not be helped because she wasn't close enough to being dead yet. And he was like, this is appalling. And it's like, yes. And we were all trying to tell you that this is what would happen. And you thought you knew more. Now you've all caught the car and you've created a giant mess out of the healthcare system. And now you're crying on TV? Spare us. And let's just not do the dumb thing now. You know, we've got all these states that could decide they aren't going to do the dumb thing. They could decide they're just going to adopt the Roe standard, which worked for 50 years to keep an equilibrium. It was a, a compromise. You can't get an abortion all the way through pregnancy. You can get an abortion in the first trimester. You can get an abortion that's more regulated in the second trimester. In the third trimester, people are really saving people's lives and things like that. And that's kind of how it worked. And why shouldn't we adopt that standard in all 50 states? And many states already have. I think it's up to us to elect people who will do that so it's sensible, so that people never have to confront the pain point that is the thing that would save your life or the thing that would build your family is now unobtainable for you because you live in the wrong zip code. This really surface level understanding of abortion, of being a irresponsible form of contraception, that it's just people who are frivolous with it and don't care about human life, that narrative is just, it's not true. I mean, I welcome anyone who has the realization that they didn't know enough to be doing what they did. Introspection is always good. It's always better. I was offended that in the Supreme Court decision, they mention women not at all. They talk about ancient history, you know, badly, because I have a history degree. And it's like, <laughs> they don't know any more about history than they know about medicine, I'm sorry to say. Um, because pre road there was a whole lot of acknowledgement that there was a lot of abortion that went on because a lot of abortion needed to go on. There were a lot of miscarriages because Mother Nature is quite the abortion provider, to your earlier point, that uh, many pregnancies fail. And you need to be able to deal with that at any stage that you find it. And as a medical provider, you need to often treat people who are in the middle of this without having suspicion cast upon you. Because we need you to be confident that we as a society have your back when you're saving our lives in emergency rooms when normal things happen. We need not to create medical deserts. And we need not to be feeding this idea that somehow bad, irresponsible people need to be stopped from making their own decisions because they're bad decisions. I counseled tens of thousands of women over the course of my work at Planned Parenthood who were making decisions about pregnancies. And never once did I meet this frivolous person who just wanted to do this because they were bored that day or weren't going to fit into their prom dress or all mm. the things you hear. It's just so offensive. I met thoughtful who realized they didn't have what it took to be the parent they wanted to be in that moment. And by the same token, would we want to do anything to discourage those same people who get to a later point in their lives and want nothing more than to be parents and now are having difficulty conceiving? Do we want to be in the way of those people making their parental decisions about creating that family in the most planned of families, the ones that have to go through all the hoops of fertility treatment in order to get there? It is an easy topic to be judgmental around, and it is a very complex topic to really master. We are hearing about 10-year-old rape victims, and I'm sorry to say from my career, that isn't all that rare. 
Hmm. And at Planned Parenthood, I was delighted when we added a certain amount of anesthetic to our abortion care because one of the compelling things to me was if you have a 12-year-old rape victim, they really don't need to remember a lot about that day. Let's make people as comfortable as they can be. And that's the kind of thing you really think about. And it's like, do we really want that 12-year-old to have a baby? Yeah. Do we really want that assault to be something this person is reminded of every day for the rest of their lives? One of my favorite episodes from your podcast is when you brought on the Reverend Monica Cassaro, one of the affiliate chaplains of Planned Parenthood. First of all, I did not know that Planned Parenthood had affiliate chaplains, and I loved learning the history of the church and certain ministers and people of many different faiths actually helping people before Roe v. Wade mm -hmm. find the health care that they needed. And her story about chaplains and reverends and ministers and all different faiths being tired of being at somebody's call to last rites because they had a botched abortion. Mm -hmm. The paradox between using faith as an argument to take away a right or to be anti-abortion or anti-choice and learning that many people of the faith actually have been very supportive of this before Roe v. Wade and even now yes. and learning the history of abortion in Judaism, abortion in Islam. Mm -hmm. There is a patron saint in Catholicism of abortion. I think one of the things that happened over time was that clergy people from all religions and denominations were the ones who were hearing the cry of women who were in these tough situations and they wanted to be helpful in whatever way. And a good many religions do not consider fetuses to have any kind of supremacy over women. They also almost universally consider everybody in the religion to have a kind of moral agency the person in the religion makes their own decision about how they are going to confront the various conflicts that happen in their lives. Clergy people were absolutely instrumental in saving women's lives during the pre-row period. They were often the ones that ran the undergrounds. They were trusted counselors and advisors to the people in their own congregations and ultimately people who found them. And will again be key to ensuring people remain safe. They often are the ones that know the struggles of a mother of four who suddenly has an unintended pregnancy. They follow people through their infertility journeys. They are in those sort of moments of the dark nights of the soul. They are people who aren't there to judge. They're people who are there to assist in, in the spiritual journey that people go through. So I think that there are some people who have genuine spiritual dialogue in their own heads about what they should do about this. And that is absolutely the right of anyone who considers themselves a spiritual or religious person. Where we as a pluralistic society have landed in America is that's somebody's own dialogue. That's the essence of being pro-choice. If you feel that you cannot have an abortion because it would violate your ethics or your religion or whatever, then you are free not to have one. And somebody else who has a different whole construct in their religion is free to exercise that. And there are some religions that are absolutely clear. There are parts of Judaism, for example, that say in the event that there's a conflict between a woman's life and a fetus's life, you must save the woman. So in some ways, sort of a very absolutist kind of Catholicism has been the thing that people have interpreted as being the religious point of view about this. And that is not at all where many, many denominations find themselves. And there are most of the mainline Protestants have a pro-choice ethic. There are certainly Catholics for a free choice. There are a couple of different schools in Judaism, a couple of different schools in Islam. But there are very few that say the woman needs to sacrifice her life in order for this to happen. That is not present almost anywhere. And as a result, you find these clergy people who are ministering to an entire family about what would be best for that. 
And it's a very humane approach for the most part. I just think that a lot of times when there's a debate about this topic or you're having two talking heads on TV, Mm -hmm. very often sort of the anti-abortion pro-life is represented by someone of a faith and typically a Christian faith. And Mm -hmm. and then the other person is never represented, anybody that's like pro-choice or, you know, anti-judgment. It's never represented by someone of a faith. And it's just important to realize that here we are again talking about nuance and how, you know, you can't just make these blanket statements. Let's make sure that we don't do things that prevent people from building their families in a deliberate way like they do when they seek your care. And let's not put ourselves in other people's shoes and decide we know what's good for their family by chasing them across state lines or being the vigilantes that collect $25,000 because of somebody else's misery or Mm -hmm. any of those horrific things that are suggested. We don't want to be those people. If some of us are those people, we don't want to be the people that rat out our neighbors who are just trying to get health care. We all just need to stand up and say, no, this isn't the kind of world we want to live in, and that's not the kind of health care we want to do. And those are not the doctors that we have that went to school to take good care of us. We are not going to vilify them. That is not who we want to be. I do want to emphasize that there are no current laws that are impacting or controlling IVF right now, that this threat is very much if these personhood bills go into place, then could they be interpreted as limits on how we treat and uh, work with embryos in our IVF lab? And so I just, you know, ASRM, American Society of Reproductive Medicine, is not saying that anybody should move embryos out of certain states or into certain states. So, you know, patients are talking about this, but nobody is actually making that threat or changing anything right now. But the reason we need to talk about this is because we don't want to be complacent. We want to actually act and make sure that things that could have those consequences don't go into place. Because certainly I knew it was under threat, but I truly was in denial that Roe v. Wade would ever be overturned. So what can people do that Mm -hmm. want to help and and want to make sure that reproductive rights are protected. Well, continue to follow podcasts like Dr. Laura's because she will be updating you, of course, if anything like this happens. And be sure you're, you're keeping yourself aware of what's going on in your state. And vote like your life depends on it because while we don't want it to, it could well. And for those of us who have now, we're past the point of being pregnant ourselves, this impacts everyone we love, whether they're young men or women or whatever. This is about building families and the future and people being able to make their own decisions as healthy families that look to their own resources internally. And let's not let it get this way. Let's not let it go there. And let's express ourselves as citizens, have this conversation and say, no, this has all gone far enough let us institute some normalish kind of policy about this and put this sorry episode behind us. We have started a group, Doctors for Fertility, a nonprofit organization, a 501c3 that is working hard to protect reproductive rights. And when we get our message out there trying to tell people, how can we protect reproductive care? for building families, we have like five points. We're like, okay, number one, share your story. Mm -hmm. You know, one in eight people have infertility and need assisted reproduction. One in four pregnancies end in miscarriage. You know, Mm -hmm. ectopic pregnancy is more common. You or someone you know with a uterus is going to need this care. And so share your story to make people realize that this is not uncommon. This can happen to anyone. Mm -hmm. Number two, have difficult conversations. I think we all need to learn from each other and listen to differing opinions. Social media has gotten us so siloed that we do need to have difficult conversations. Number three, we talk about letting your representatives know how you feel. Write them on a federal, on a state, on a county, on a city level. Number four, vote. And number five, donate. You know, Doctors Mm -hmm. for Fertility, we need resources to educate, 
increase awareness, support politicians and people that are going to protect reproductive rights. Those are really strong ways that you can help protect reproductive rights. Your stories could be so powerful because I would bet you anything, the people who are thinking about these policies in a really restrictive way are not thinking about you. And they're not thinking about what they could be doing that could be impacting a whole group of people that they have not imagined them impacting. And just understanding that might make people understand that there may be a good many other things they also do not understand. Chris, I cannot thank you enough for coming on today and your years of work helping protect reproductive rights and that fight is not over. Um, So delightful. So delightful (laughs) to talk to you again, my friend. Uh, And how can we find you? Fallofroad.com. And Fall of Row podcast is available both on Apple and Google Podcasts and wherever podcasts are found. Uh, I think that it's important for people to continue to hear about this as it evolves. Chris, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. It's wonderful to talk to you. Thank you so much for being here today. I just learned so much from our conversation with Chris Charbonneau, her years of experience in helping people with reproductive rights and perspective on the fallout after the overturn of Roe v. Wade. I see it from my perspective. I think about my own patients trying to build their families, the threat to IVF and reproductive care. It's incredible to learn about, to think about. It's unnerving, but we need to stay informed. We need to learn more, and that certainly happened today. Thank you for being here. I'm your host, Dr. Laura Shaheen, and this is Baby or Bust. If you like this episode, let us know. Give us a five-star review and follow the show wherever you listen to your podcast. Baby or Bust is produced by Mark Ramsey, Jamie Solis, and Greg Moga. Executive produced by Paul Anderson for Workhouse Media. Baby or Bust is a Mark Ramsey Media production.